Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for attending our kickoff event during the International Education Series. My name is Annabelle Haudigi, and I am the graduate, sorry, the administrative assistant here at Multicultural Affairs. And behind me is Deanna Cordova. She's the director for the department. Today, I have the honor of introducing our co-sponsor for the event, Dr. Brust. He is the Associate Professor of Political Science and the Faculty Advisor to the Catholic Newman Center here on campus. I will let him take it away. Great, thank you very much, uh, Annabelle. And uh, thank you all for being here. I'd like to introduce Father Christopher Lawrence Zugger. Uh, he was born in New York, Buffalo, 1954. Graduated from St. Bonaventure University in 1997 with a degree in sociology and history, and then also a master's of divinity with a focus on ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical history from Western Washington Theological Union in 1981. Uh, he was ordained as a priest in uh, 1981 for the Byzantine Ruthenian Eparchy of Passaic, uh, basically a rite of the Catholic Church. Uh, he worked in youth ministry. For a few years, and then in 1982, was transferred to Arizona, and uh, then also in uh, Van Nuys, um, in the then eparchy of Van Nuys, kind of a diocese of Van Nuys, so to speak. Uh, he founded St. Thomas the Apostle Church in Gilbert, Arizona. Uh, he's taught upper-level classes at Aquino Institute for the Diocese of Phoenix. Uh, he also became a pastor of Our Lady of Perpetual Help Church in Albuquerque. Um, since 1985, he's been teaching adult classes in what is called an OASIS program. In 2008, he's he took a medical retirement, uh, but he continues to uh, preach, teach, uh, give retreats. And he is also a very prolific uh, uh, researcher and scholar. His uh, book in 2001, published by Syracuse University, Press, the Forgotten Catholics in the Soviet Union from Lenin through Stalin. Uh, he also has another book, uh, 2009, Finding a Hidden Church, uh, published by Eastern Christian Publications. Uh, he also has a um, uh, two forthcoming titles, uh, Looking Back on Tomorrow, the History and Mission of the Byzantine Catholic Church, uh, and then 1,200 Years in Catholics in the Gulag, Heroes of Faith. Uh, so uh, he's uh, well, well versed okay, in a topic, obviously, and he's going to be making a, a great uh, presentation on uh, people's lives of faith uh, behind uh, the Iron Cur Curtain. Uh, the communist controlled countries. So please welcome uh, Father uh, Chris Zugger. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Annabelle, can you put up the first slide, please? So there'll be a slideshow with uh, text and photos so that you're able to follow along um, because it'll just make it a little easier and also maps in the region I'm dealing with since it's not that common uh, for most Americans uh, to know. So Iron Curtain, of course, comes from the famous phrase of uh, Winston Churchill after the Soviet Union took over Eastern Europe. Uh, in 1945 and eventually established communist states uh, by 1948 from the Baltic Sea to the Adriatic. And um, in so doing, they cut Eastern Europe off from the rest of the continent with the goal really of cutting them off from the whole planet um, into what was called the socialist bloc. And I don't see slideshow yes sorry i am trying to pull it up and for some reason it's not letting me give me just one second i'm sorry okay. sorry so the territory i'm dealing with is eastern czechoslovakia which used to be eastern czechoslovakia and now slovakia northeastern hungary and then a province in western ukraine 
uh, now called Transcarpathia. So here we are. And if you go to the next one for me, Annabelle, thank you. All right. So just terms, Catholics, Christians who are recognized the Pope of Rome uh, as Vicar of Christ on Earth. Uh, the Greek Catholics, which is what I belong to, the Byzantine Rite. Um, and one of the things to bear in mind is that most diocesan priests in the Byzantine Rite are married and have families, which became important under the communists because they thought they could use families, uh, pressure on families against the priests to force them to break with Rome. Uh, Roman Catholics are those who follow the Roman Rite and the Latin Rite, which is the dominant rite in the United States. Um, the Orthodox use the Byzantine Rite, but belong to Eastern Orthodox churches, and the Russian Orthodox um, are under the Patriarchate of Moscow. And after World War II, the Patriarchate was collaborating with Stalin in a number of areas uh, in order to try and survive, and one of those was forcing the Greek Catholics into the Orthodox Church. Uh, next slide. All right, communism is opposed to religion, and this is the case still. Uh, China recently issued an edict that no believers can belong to the Communist Party in China. Why? Because religion gives an alternate worldview to the one that the party proclaims, right? Religion defends the dignity of the human person, sees people as worthwhile in and of themselves. The Catholic Church has its own independent head in the Pope, and so it's outside of state control, and Catholics look to the Pope parties. That was another issue. And as I mentioned already, the Russian Orthodox Church has its collaboration right, right until the end of Soviet power um, because they have been co-opted by the state. Under communism, there is no religious instruction for minors, anyone under 18 years old. Churches and religions have no media, no publishing, no charitable work, no teaching. Religious orders usually are banned, as they were in the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia. Um, property ownership is not allowed, and so forth. Uh, next slide. So in January 1918, the first law on religion was passed in the Soviet Union, called separation of church and state, which is really a misnomer because the state spent the rest of its history interfering with the life of the church and controlling the church. All the churches and the Jews, the Muslims, the Buddhists, everybody lost everything with this law. They lost their bank accounts, they lost their investments, they lost their property. Uh, churches, temples had to be rented by a local Soviet, a council of 20 adult parishioners. Uh, churches were assessed taxes and utility rates that were up to 20, 20 times the normal rate clergy had to pay at least a third of their income uh, in tax. With a new law in 1929, all clergy lost their housing, their ration cards, their voting rights, their salaries. Uh, and as I mentioned, absolutely nothing could be conducted by a religious body except worship. That's it. And worship is restricted within the building. Okay, the next slide. So the goal in communism in Soviet times and in China, Vietnam, Cuba is an atheist society. So atheist education is introduced in kindergarten. So no teachers can be a believer. If you are a believer, you have to be very careful. Um, atheism was required straight to university. You were required to take exams in atheist teaching. You have to pass your exams in atheist teaching. Known believers uh, were generally closed out of university education, promotions of work were lost or forbidden, and you could not, uh, if you were under 18, you couldn't serve at the altar, you couldn't sing in the choir, and again, this applied to anybody of any faith tradition. So these churches behind the Iron Curtain were facing major obstacles. Okay, the next slide, please. So the goal, this is a cosmonaut in space, right? The Soviet version of an astronaut. There is no God. They made these posters that after the cosmonauts first went into space, they did not find God. So Bohanet, there is no God. And if you notice at the bottom, the church towers and the mosque, 
Everything is slanted to show that they're being conquered by the power of science and the brilliance of Soviet life. And this is progress. Religion is not progressive. Next slide, please. So this is the ultimate goal. As churches were closed, they were wrecked um, uh, to be put into productive use. Clubs, cinemas, barns, stables, granaries, uh, gyms, indoor swimming pools. And what they liked to do in the Soviet Union in particular, when a building uh, was made into some secular facility, the altar was replaced with public toilets. So if this was a gymnasium where the altar is in the back there, would it become the bathrooms and locker rooms? And that's pretty much the norm throughout Soviet history to do that, to make such an insult, you know, to the former sanctuaries. Okay, next slide. All right, so these are the territories I went into. Transcarpathian Oblast used to be called uh, Carpathian Ruthenia. It had been part of the Kingdom of Hungary for a thousand years. After World War I, it was the easternmost part of Czechoslovakia. And after 1945, it was forcibly annexed into the Soviet Union and now belongs to Ukraine. Hungary uh, was a kingdom in Central Europe. Uh, it was communist as of 1948. Uh, Slovakia was part of the former Czechoslovakia uh, that was formed after World War I and became communist also in 1948. The majority of the people I dealt with were Greek Catholics uh, who were concentrated in uh, Eastern Slovakia, Transcarpathia, uh, Northern Hungary, and along the Slovak frontier with Hungary. So if you go to the next slide, so this is Czechoslovakia as it was in 1938. Ruthenia and Eastern Slovakia are majority Greek Catholic. So these territories are the stronghold of the Byzantine Catholic Church in Central Europe. So Subcarpathian Ruthenia at the far right was annexed in 1945 into the Soviet Union. Um, Eastern Slovakia remained part of the Czechoslovak People's Republic that was formed in 1948 after the war. This shows, this map shows how Czechoslovakia was broken up during World War II. Uh, if you go to the next slide, and this is the purple areas are the territories that were mostly inhabited by Greek Catholics, where that's a majority of the population. So Subcarpathian Rus is now known as the Transcarpathian Oblast. So I would fly into Budapest and then travel north and enter Ukraine either from Hungary or I would go into Slovakia and then cross the border near Ushavad and uh, and then go in there. Most of my interviews that I conducted were done in these regions that you see here. Northeastern Hungary from Mishkos across and then north uh, Slovakia and then all through Subcarpathian routes, uh, Transcarpathia. So you have an idea of where I was. And the next slide is Hungary. So the two darkest areas in the upper right are the majority pre-Catholic regions of Hungary, uh, the Eparchy of Mishkos and uh, near the Jikasa. So that's a territory that we're dealing with, so you have an idea where I was and where they are today. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? So these are the Sisters of Social Service, uh, a Roman Catholic community founded on the last years of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the and uh, after World War I. This actually is their habit. They were founded to work with the poor in the industrial slums. And their foundress, Margaret Slavka, uh, de designed this habit so that they would wear gray skirt, gray jacket, white blouse with a medallion of the Holy Spirit, but no veil, so that they would uh, be more accessible, it was felt, uh, to the working poor. Now, these women, the older women, all served as nuns under communism. This is the ceremony of receiving new novices into the community, which is why they're holding uh, flowers. 
this community survived completely in the underground. Uh, they were banned uh, in 1949 in Hungary uh, and faced tremendous obstacles, as we'll see. Uh, the next slide, please. There we go. Sisters of St. Basil the Great were in Slovakia and Transcarpathia and also in Hungary. This is the principal Greek Catholic order for women. Um, these were completely banned in uh, Czechoslovakia in 1950, Hungary, and then um, Transcarpathia in 1949. They also survived uh, totally in the underground. So they had to give up their habit in order to survive in the underground. Okay, the next slide, please. All right, so 1945, Carpathia Ruthenia becomes Transcarpathia and is added into uh, the Soviet Union without the consent of the people. And there was immediate pressure on the Greek Catholics to break with Rome, the Union of 1646, and join the Patriarchate because the Patriarchate was under Stalin's thumb because it was co-opted and because they did not want the Greek Catholics to be uh, united to Rome, which was you know, independent and in the West, it's, it's a supporter of the West. So what started right away in 45 was the arresting of priests, murders of priests, um, removal of the sisters of St. Basil from all of their schools. Uh, the state took over everything, uh, the media, the schools, hospitals, orphanages, publishing, everything and all political parties were banned. The bishop, Bishop Blessed Theodore Ramja, led the opposition to this. And so he was executed on October 31st, 1947. He had survived an assassination attempt, he was in the hospital. Khrushchev and Stalin sent a secret agent to poison him uh, in his hospital bed after he survived the surgery. In 49, the complete suppression of the Catholic Church was ordered and clergy that would not cooperate by breaking with Rome uh, were deported into the gulag. Um, they were sent to camps around the Soviet Union and put to hard labor. And their wives and children were thrown into the streets, literally. And the sisters uh, were dispersed out of their convents. Okay, the next slide. Father Stefan Bandas was a great historian of the Greek Catholic Church who taught at the seminary. This is what he looked like shortly before he was arrested. Uh, I interviewed his son and daughter-in-law, uh, which is where I got a lot of my history from, on materials that he wrote in secret after he came back from the camps. And the next slide shows what he looked like when he got out of the camps. He was so transformed that when he came back, neither his wife nor his mother recognized who he was. They had no idea who he was until he spoke to them because his appearance had been so changed. It just shows what they went through in these camps, that their own families had no idea who they were. Now the next slide, please. So in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, both were occupied by the Red Army. It did not pull out after the war ended. Uh, both were taken over by the communists. Um, Czechoslovakia, the Greek Catholic Church, was totally suppressed in 1950. Um, persecution had begun in 1948 uh, after the coup d'etat that took place in these countries. Um, and again, the party took over everything, um, not only from the churches, but in general society, all political parties were suppressed. There were attempts to force the Roman Catholics to break with Rome, uh, which failed. Uh, in Czechoslovakia, or at least to join in with the communists. And of course, there was no religious instruction of young people whatsoever. Okay, the next slide. So in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, religious orders were suppressed. They were not allowed to receive new members. Uh, Hungary uh, arrested uh, all of these monks and nuns in the span of 49 and 50. Only three little religious communities were allowed to survive, and the Sisters of St. Basil and the Sisters of Social Service were not allowed. Uh, in 1950, Czechoslovakia arrested every monk and nun in the country. One sister escaped out of thousands. There was only one sister who got away and escaped to Austria. 
Um, all of them were put into concentration monasteries which became labor camps, and they stayed there for the next 18 years. Uh, the Greek Catholic Church was suppressed in 1950 as well. All of the bishops and priests were arrested, and the churches were forced into orthodoxy, and the priests were put at hard labor. And again, the wives and children were thrown out of the rectories and um, into the streets. Okay, the next slide. So how do the faith survive? Which is what I'm doing. So religious instruction had to be done by parents uh, inside the family or very small groups in private homes. When the priests were in the camps or in these uh, in the Gulag, in the Soviet Union, or in the labor camps, they had taught the people how to do prayer services, which they did outside of locked churches or in the forest or out in the cemeteries, uh, at homes and behind closed windows. Uh, people were at a re risk of arrest um, or heavy fines. Uh, when some priests had gone successfully underground, uh, these priests traveled on circuits uh, to trusted families while they had jobs working as janitors and night watchmen. Uh, there was a continual risk of betrayal. Uh, arrests were done at clandestine weddings. I know of three priests who were arrested while doing uh, nighttime weddings. The brooms wanted new cars. So we could wait 20 years to get a car. And so the grooms betrayed the men who were going to marry them. Police burst in after the wedding and um, took the priests away. Uh, trails and funerals. It was very dangerous for these underground priests. Uh, the Latin Rite parishes that were left open, which is not many in Transcarpathia, the priests would let the Greek Catholic priests come in at night to uh, hold services. But it had to be whispered and, and no candles, no lights on. And before they were arrested, most priests instructed the lay people how to conduct uh, valid baptisms and weddings and what to do for a funeral service. Okay, the next slide, please. The Bishop Petro Oros was the leader of the underground in Transcarpathia. He had been secretly consecrated uh, by Blessed Theodore Ramsha. He led these underground priests from a cabin up in the Carpathian Mountains. He himself went out holding services in cemeteries and private homes and barns. After Stalin died, he was uh, picked up and held in jail for two weeks, but then they let him go because everything was changing in the USSR. They weren't sure what to do with him. So he resumed his uh, pastoral work and was caught and was publicly executed in the main street of a town uh, by uh, one of the policemen. Okay, the next slide. So the social service sisters, pretty typical of a Roman Catholic community in Hungary or Czechoslovakia. The known sisters were under police surveillance at all times. Um, they were very restricted in their work. A few of them were allowed to do what was called soft work in parish offices or as a sacristan at a local church. A few of them were allowed to work in jobs like state run hospitals or old age homes or with the disabled. The rest of them were forced to do heavy work. They had to do construction, uh, street cleaning, even building railroads. The priests were ordered by the police to report on the sisters. And they told me that there was one young priest that they went to for confession. He was under such tremendous pressure all the time, he simply could not take it anymore. And he actually committed suicide because he did not want to betray them, but he was constantly being called in by the secret police for interrogation. In Hungary, they were not allowed to live in communal apartments. They could live uh, you know, like two or three together. They had to live with their families or on their own, and they were absolutely forbidden uh, to meet with any young people. Okay, the next slide, please. The Sisters of St. Basil, Czechoslovakia, they were all in concentration monasteries. Even in the factories, the workers were not allowed to talk to them because the sisters were considered to have a corrupting influence. 
Um, worship services could be held in the monastery camps, but only in the Roman Rite, not the Byzantine Rite. They could only wear their habits uh, at worship or when they were burying someone. Only their families were allowed to contact them. If you broke your vows, if they would leave the Greek Catholic Church, if they would give up their vows, they could, they could be released. But none of them did. Uh, and that's true for the Latin Rite sisters as well. None of them gave up their vows. Okay, the next one, please. In Ukraine, it was uh, a little different. They could have little communities, or two or three in, a, in an apartment. But again, they were under police surveillance. They had to check in with the NKVD or the KGB, the secret police, on a regular basis. Only secular jobs. They were very active in Samistat. Samistat is self-publishing. It's a, a popular thing with political and religious dissidents in the Soviet Union. You wrote everything by hand. Typewriters were hard to come by and were registered with the state. So they had to write all of these old prayer books and catechisms that had been published before World War II. All of that had to be copied over and over by hand and then distributed uh, illegally to people. And the sisters were active in teaching religion uh, in private homes. And they also led prayer services when most of the priests were in the gulag. Okay, the second, next slide, please. Sister Teofilia was at the hospital when Blessed Theodore Ranja was murdered. And she was arrested because she had smuggled out information through uh, a railroad worker into what was then democratic Czechoslovakia, which it then went to the Papal Nuncio in Prague, which then went to the Vatican. Someone found out she had smuggled this information out. She was betrayed. And so she was arrested and sent to the Arctic. She was sent to fisheries in the Arctic Ocean. They made her walk out into the ocean without any protective gear. Um, and they tried to murder her a number of times. Uh, and she said she survived only because she prayed that through the intercession of Blessed Theodore Rancho that she would survive. When they finally let her out of the gulag, she weighed 90 pounds. And she never really recovered her health. Okay, the next slide, please. So, secret worship. Independent groups are feared in communist countries, okay, because communists are always afraid of people getting together outside of a party controlled environment. So, they would be accused of these major crimes. This was very common to be accused of these crimes in Soviet history um, for Christians and other believers. And all of these carried heavy penalties. The priests would work circuits. Each priest was assigned in specific villages or specific neighborhoods. They would travel at night um, to go to these places where they would administer the sacraments or offer services. For confessions, people knew where they could go to a certain priest. You had to go to the house or apartment early if you wanted to go to confession. You would get in through, like it was a house through the back garden or you would come in from the street, but you had a coat, um, doorbell, how many times you bring it, passwords, all of which changed all the time. I knew of a young priest who would crawl through drainage ditches in order to get to the back garden and then climb over the fence, crawl through the yard so no one would see him, then get into the house or into the shed and in the backyard, and that's where he would offer the liturgy. Um, the liturgy is normally sung in the Byzantine, right? You could not done that way and everything had to be whispered if you were in an apartment building you of course had to limit who could come in because people would be suspicious you had to put on the radio or tv to cover any noise you also had to teach your children lead a double life little children answer questions teachers in kindergarten would say on the first day and who teach, who prays at home put up your hand if you pray at home you had to tell your four-year-old don't put up your hand never tell anyone who pray. People in communist countries lead double lives. You have to choose who you're going to confide in. The next slide, please. So, religious funeral services, the priests would come at night, then there would be a secular funeral in the morning. Uh, couldn't have prayers in a public ceremony. 
Um, if a Greek Catholic priest died, then the Latin Rite priest would show up at the cemetery sometimes if he was allowed to. Otherwise, he would come early in the morning to bless the body. Um, graves could only be blessed at night if you were going to have um, that done. When you had the funeral of a known priest, the communists would show up outside the house with bands, with loudspeakers. They would harass the people all the way from the house to the cemetery. Even during the burial at the cemetery, you would have all of this blaring noise taking place. Uh, for weddings, Roman Catholics can have a valid wedding if the groom and bride exchange their vows in front of two witnesses. The Catholics need a priest. That's why it became such an opportunity for betrayal and such a dangerous thing to do. Baptisms can be done validly by lay people. They were taught how to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we need a Greek Catholic priest is needed in Byzantine right to give the baby confirmation as we normally do the sacraments together, baptism and confirmation. Um, so a lot of people didn't get confirmed so much later. Okay, the next slide, please. So if you conducted illegal worship, these are photos that were secretly taken after people were arrested for having service in their house. The men are being dragged away first and then the women. The penalties were very high in the Soviet Union. It could be anywhere from three to five months salary which is crippling. They could levy that not only on the homeowner, but on every adult attending the service. So a tremendous amount of money that would have to be raised. And people did not have a lot of money sitting around at the bank. Uh, you could be in prison. You could be in prison for going. You could be in prison for hosting. Uh, you could be put in a psychiatric prison treated with uh, antipsychotic drugs who would be accused of suffering from something the Soviets created called creeping schizophrenia uh, because you were a believer or because you were against communism uh, and people could be trapped in those hospitals for years. Uh, I met a man who survived. Uh, his wife went to meet with him and was shocked that he was emaciated and he couldn't speak, couldn't talk to him. Um, at all. She couldn't carry on a conversation with me. He was so heavily medicated. So by doing these things, people ran very big risks. Okay, the next slide, please. Czechoslovakia had the Prague Spring started in January 1968. It only lasted until August as the Soviet Union and uh, the satellite countries of the Warsaw Pact Invaded to put an end to the liberalization. So during this time period, the Orthodox parishes were allowed to vote as to whether or not they wanted to return to the Greek Catholic Church, parishes that had been forced into Orthodox in 1950. And almost all of them did so. And the priests and nuns that were still alive were allowed to come back and to work, but the seminary was not restored. The sisters were not allowed to take in new candidates legally. They were restricted to those two ministries, old age homes and the mentally handicapped. No media was returned. The atheist pressures continued. Um, and so religious education still had to be done secretly and illegally. At the church in Utina, uh, they actually had a secret room uh, where the priests gave instruction to children and teenagers. Uh, and again, a double life. It's always a double life. To in whom do I confide? To who do I trust? Who can I talk to? There's famous stories from the Soviet Union of a wife or a husband taking a baby to a priest to be baptized, and the priest saying, I already baptized this baby. I can't baptize it a second time. The spouse had no idea that the other spouse was a Christian. They had no idea that they had married a fellow believer. That's how privatized religion had become and how secretive people became. Okay, the next slide, please. In Hungary, the seminary survived and priestly formation survived and the churches were left open. 
for the Greek Catholics, but there were no monasteries. The monks and nuns had all been thrown out, and uh, there was no, uh, a few of them were allowed to help at parishes, but not all of them were given that privilege. The big shrine in the north at Adiapaj was allowed them to stay open, and the annual pilgrimages in August took place, where there was continual harassment of everybody who went there. If you were to drive someone to the pilgrimage, you, your license was written down. Uh, cars and wagons were blocked from getting into the village itself. There were spies constantly um, at the services. In the churches, there were spies who were sent in to record the sermons. Uh, if you could go back, please. Um, thank you. And um, for the families, the priest wives and children were harassed at work. In school believers were harassed at work. Uh, couldn't build new churches where people were moving to or new rectories. Uh, they showed me a, a little house that this priest family had been forced to cram into to live. And then there was one small room where he would offer the liturgy and then people had to stand around the house in all kinds of weather in order to participate in the liturgy. And all that was designed, of course, to meet the people's faith and commitment. New towns were built in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, these new industrial centers. And it was absolutely forbidden for any religious services to be held in those no churches or temples were built. So the priests who went into these new towns um, in Hungary, even though they were legal themselves, could be arrested or at least given a heavy fine for going in and doing services. But it was interesting that people who moved into these towns kept on making arrangements for priests to come for the sacraments or for blessings uh, because they weren't going to give up their faith. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So how did the sisters survive? All of the communities did the same thing in all three countries. Um, families were very reluctant to foster vocations among their daughters and for that matter, among their sons, uh, you know, because they didn't want their children to suffer yet. You need priests and sisters. Uh, known sisters were always at a danger of police raids, you know, and being called in for interrogation. Uh, they had clandestine masses or divine liturgies uh, in their apartments. They would do retreats out in forests or in national parks or even in city parks under the guise of being uh, at a picnic and just looking like a bunch of women gathered together for a party. Uh, they use some as that their handwritten materials. Uh, women that wanted to join the community had to memorize the rule of their particular religious order. They had to have hiding places for their books, for their Bibles. All their materials were either Samizdat or were published before World War II. And their vows could only be taken in private. It's the only time to ever put a veil on or wore a cross because uh, you couldn't have your family there. Most times their parents didn't know that they had become sisters, uh, let alone uh, anybody else outside of the family. But what's amazing to me is the number of women that continued to join. The influence that the pre-war sisters had in their uh, work, in their interactions with other Catholics and Roman Catholics, that they really, when communism ended, there were young nuns ready to come out of the underground. It wasn't all old women that were worn out from their sufferings. It was really remarkable. Okay, the next slide. All right, so 1991, communism ends. And everyone in the West thinks life in the East is perfect and everything's hunky-dory, the communists are gone. Big problem is very few communists were arrested. Most of these secret policemen were never charged. Very few companies did anything like the Allies did in Germany after World War II with the Nuremberg trials. That simply did not happen. And a lot of the communists uh, took over the, the best businesses, the best factories. They got involved in government. Uh, the men who tortured innocent victims got pensions, uh, while their victims got really nothing. And I started going in 2001. On my fourth trip 
2004, I had been collecting a lot of information from the transcriptation of Oblast in Ukraine. When I went in from Slovakia that year, I was uh, held up at the border. Uh, they were checking my passport longer than normal. But then I went in and spent two weeks. I did more interviews, was taking notes and so forth. And when I was leaving, I was coming out to go back to Hungary with a carload of Greek Catholic priests. And we were stopped, you know, to get the passport stamped. And the guard came with a submachine gun and started yelling at me that I was a spy and that my passport was faked and ordered me out of the car. And like a good American, I started to get out of the car. And the priests were pulling me back into the car, and then more guards came. They started pulling me out of the car, and everybody's screaming at me that I'm a spy and that I'm under arrest, and the priests are all yelling, and it, well, I was scared. I was And there's no consulate nearby. The embassy's in Kiev. And I don't speak Ukrainian. And it was, they could have hauled me away. And it was just the worst experience of my life. And when they finally let go of me, they told me that I could never return with that passport that I had. They knew who I was. And every priest in the car went, I got back in the car. And they let go of me. All of the priests said at the exact same time, you just were given a message. Across the border in Hungary, they just have my passport. Welcome back, Father. No problem. And I get to Maria Poch to the shrine, and all the priests get out of the car, tell the Hungarian priests what happened. And the Hungarian priests all came, and they all said the exact same sentence. You've just been given a message. They don't want you digging this up. So this was 13 years after communism, I think. And I had had a gun pulled on me earlier um, in 2002 uh, in Ukraine uh, when I was doing an interview. A policeman had pulled out a gun at me. My relatives don't know some of this stuff, so they're not going to be abused when they find this out for the first time if they're listening to this. But. You know, it was very, very frightening. It was just a, a little taste of what these people endured for all those years and how easily you could disappear. And that was in a supposedly free country back in you know, 2004. Okay, the next slide, please. This is a fresco in a chapel in Porto Lego in Ukraine. This depicts uh, the bishops from Czechoslovakia and uh, Ukraine that were you know, its bishops, priests, and Sister Theophilia that either were executed or died in prison and camps um, or died afterwards of their sufferings. So it's just a, a small sample of some of the leadership in the underground um, and the ultimate price that they all paid. Okay, the next slide. So, you know, basically, I always ask people these questions that whenever I do a talk like this, what would I do? You know, there's that show on ABC, John Quinones, they set up, you know, a scene and, and then uh, in public and see how people would respond. What would you do? Well, what would I do? You know, I was profoundly impressed by these people that I met over the years and, and their stories. I, just amazing stories and how determined they were. How would we manage under such circumstances? Why even make the effort? Now, how do you teach your kids under those circumstances? How really, you know, in a rapidly changing world, a rapidly secularizing world, how important is my faith to me now? And would I take those kind of risks? And how willing am I to stand up for my beliefs? This one bishop told me that he was called in, the last interrogation he was called in for, uh, he showed up with his suitcase all packed, ready to go to the gulag. 
and this was in the late 80s when things were supposedly changing and the kgb agent asked him once again to break with rome and he said no i won't and i have my backpack i'm ready to go and he said what do you mean you're ready to go he said you can take me to prison i'll go back to prison and the agent looked at him and he said no i respect you for your convictions you can go home much to the bishop's surprise. How strong am I in my own convictions that I would be willing to defy the civil authority and say, yeah, you can take me to prison. I'll go back. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to give up. They were remarkable. Every last one of the people I interviewed, they were just remarkable. And you know, they changed my life. They changed my whole priesthood. By meeting, which is why I write about them and teach them. So thank you very much for logging in today. And Dr. Brust, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Father Zuger, uh, really a very uh, uh, sobering uh, presentation, very enlightening, sobering um, to see, you know, the horrible conditions under which, you know, people had to live out their faith and uh, what was what was done by, you know, these communist governments to stamp out that faith. Um, and so we're very, uh, I feel I'm very appreciative of, of your presentation and to kind of present all, all of this, um, you know, this important historical, you know, information that, that affects, that has affected real persons, right? Their lives. Yeah. Um, so what we'll do now is we will turn to uh, questions. And what I'll do is I'm just, if you have a question, uh, put it into the chat box, and I'm just going to kind of take them in order, and we're gonna, we'll get to as many as we can. I take it we have about another 15 minutes or 13 minutes or something. Right. To three. So we'll just, and so if you don't, if we don't get you, sorry, but we're just going to kind of go in this order. So the first question is, uh, did those Christians give anything they used uh, by which they kept their faith? No. Uh, yeah, to me, I, I'm presuming it meant to me. Uh, I was allowed to offer liturgy with uh, chalices that had been made in the underground, uh, which was that was quite an experience. Um, that had, they had been made secretly, and then uh, I, I was able to do that twice. Um, and I got started in this because this woman was allowed to emigrate. Uh, her husband had emigrated from Czechoslovakia to America in 1938. He was supposed to have his wife and children come the following year, but World War II broke out. They never got out. And after the war, they were behind the Iron Curtain. And so they didn't get out. Well, she finally was allowed to leave with her son and his family uh, in 1980, 1980, actually. And they gave me an embroidered pillow that she had made for the underground chapel that she had in her home. And when she was allowed to leave the Soviet Union, she gave it, the priest who served her village secretly gave, told her to take the pillow with them. It was a little pillow they put on the altar, the whole gospel book. And he said, take that with you so something from us will always be free. And I was the only priest who ever asked her what happened to her in the Soviet Union. So she gave me the pillow because she said I reminded her, I reminded her of that priest she had left behind. That was quite a memento and I still have it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next question, um, and this is kind of a question that I sort of have and also someone else later on in the queue has, uh, do you have any concerns today about the possibility of such trials 
uh, happening here, or I would say kind of maybe not as overt or as strong right now, but are kind of creeping up to where people of faith might uh, be concerned? Do you have any, do you, do you think that's kind of possibility and, and what might these be? So religion is always easily mocked and religion is easily misunderstood and misinterpreted. That's one especially with people who only have a secular education or don't have any exposure to religious people. Um, while we have constitutional protections, and, it, and I, I'll tell you what, travel to countries like that, you come back to America, and you're really grateful to be born and raised in this country and to have a constitution like we have. Um, but you already see hostility to religion. And I think one of the great dangers in this country is that people are not willing to hear. People want to hear other people say only what they think, you know, they call it a bubble. And that's not American. And religion is important in America. Read Alexis de Tocqueville from his tours in the United States. You know, religion was, he saw religion as critical to the health of the American Republic have to have a healthy religious life in a democracy and you just cannot shove it aside and i think that there is such a misperception on the part of a lot of um people who have had limited exposure or very negative exposure to faith that they don't understand the power of faith and the beauty of faith and what faith contributes to society and how important so it's incumbent on people of faith to get out there and communicate what a faith-filled society is supposed to be. That's the only way we're going to keep a healthy democracy. It's the only way we're going to keep our full freedoms in this country. I really believe that. Okay, okay. Uh, so maybe this might be related, but has your profound experience in that part of the world affected your faith here in the USA? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, my sisters would always say every time I came back from a trip, I was an even stronger Catholic every single time. So, I mean, and the importance of education, the importance of good, healthy, authentic religious education at all levels of all ages. Yes, because those people would not have survived had they not been well educated before communism came and their children and grandchildren would not have had a faith life had not their parents and grandparents been able to pass that faith on. So yes. Okay, are you, are you continuing your interviews? Uh, will you go back to Slovakia? I'm physically not able to travel anymore. Um, I published the, the one book uh, finding a Hidden Church, uh, which is based on all the research I did. And, and then my third book that'll get published this year, looking back to tomorrow, also will have um, information on that, from those interviews and from the history I did. Yeah, I, I can't make the trip anymore. Okay. Uh, did those you interviewed hear about the fate of their fellow brave priests and nuns? It says, did those you interviewed hear about the fate of their fellow brave priests and nuns? Did they know about the fate of them? They, yeah, I guess that's what they mean. Did those interview hear about the fate? Did they know about the fate? So I guess maybe those you interviewed, did they know of the, the priests who, who died or nuns who died? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I mean, these were their children. Uh, most, a lot of times it was their children or surviving spouses um, or uh, other members of the family. So yes, they knew what had happened. Now, they don't know where a lot of them are, okay? Because they were buried in mass graves or they were buried in uh, cemeteries outside of labor camps. And those cemeteries were all plowed under so that the bodies can never be retrieved. So there's nowhere to go. You can't make a pilgrimage to the graves. Uh, but they, they know what happened. If they don't know exactly what happened, they do know that they're dead. Um, yeah, they don't okay. always, didn't always know details though. Okay. 
Uh, oh, here's a, are the PowerPoint slides going to be sent out? Oh, I don't know. Are you, re did you record it? Um, yes. yeah, we're recording the presentation and it'll be posted on our Multicultural Affairs YouTube page. So if anybody wants to go back and reference, you're always welcome to go back and review, see the video, if that's okay. You want to okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so I guess maybe this might be kind of maybe a more follow up of your response that uh, to that you had uh, earlier about one question, how can we as believers positively display our faith where there is a lot of negative representations of faith. Uh, I, I guess that's a, maybe a follow up once you more specifics on your response. Get out that. there. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I and mean, that's the big thing. Don't be afraid. And you know, whenever I go out, I wear a collar. Okay, you don't wear a collar. Uh, wear a crucifix. You know, don't be afraid to say grace when you're in a restaurant. When we get to go to restaurants uh, in the crazy times we live in. Um, you know, it, it, people tell an anti-Catholic joke, speak the truth. You know, but be charitable, be kind. Be, you know, again, I think there's too much in the media that Christians are dark, gloomy people or fanatics. Speak of who we are authentically. You know? And you got to know what you're talking about. You have to read. You have to look stuff up uh, on, on, on good internet sites and read good books. Okay, uh, the question here, uh, does any of this or how does all of this tie in with the message of Fatima? Is there anything like that? Going on there. It was illegal to speak of Fatima in a communist country. You could get a prison sentence for speaking about Fatima because the ultimate message of Our Lady of Fatima was Russia will be converted. She did not say it would be converted to Catholicism. She said it would be converted and that Russia's errors would be overthrown. And I did meet a priest from the Soviet Union who went in to visit her from Poland. He went in to visit his relatives and he took Fatima material with him. And he was arrested for that. And uh, another priest told me of the organist in his parish in uh, Western Ukraine. She had gotten Fatima materials from her relatives in Poland, and she was put in prison, I think, for over a year. Um, so people in Czechoslovakia and Hungary, they knew about Fatima uh, because they uh, you know, had heard about it before 1945. Um, in Slovakia, they still call First Saturday, which was the day that Mary said to go to church and pray on First Saturday. They call it Batimska Sobotu. It's Fatima Saturday. Uh, so it's it's very well known. Okay. Um, so basically, yeah, I guess this was a, a follow-up uh, kind of reiteration of a pre previous question uh, that was put up again. Uh, but maybe it's worth talking about it again because I think it is of concern about um, about having any kind of furthering comments about the encroachments of the limiting limiting functions of faith in America. Is there reason to fear for the future? And I could bring up myself one example. So, like the Health and Human Services mandate in the Obama administration was forcing different different religious organizations, including Little Sisters of a Poor, a group of nuns. Right to provide you know, contraceptive abortifacient and sterilizations in their um, in their uh, insurance plans, when, you know, and they were kind of in a sense being coerced to do this. And if they had to pay the fines, they would have been wiped out completely. Yeah, it's it's again using the Constitution, using the Bill of Rights, using the laws that exist in order to protect ourselves and also really getting out there and explaining what we believe, why we believe it, and that it is valid to believe this, and that we have a right to believe this, and we have a right to teach this. It is our guaranteed right by law, but it is also our guaranteed right by the fact that all people are made in the image and likeness of God and are supposed to be treated accordingly. And if we treat others 
as being made in the image and likeness of God and ask for that in return. I think that goes a long way to making an impact on, again, a culture that has drifted away from its worries. Uh, I mean, it's, we, we easily say Judeo-Christian tradition, but that's really important, Judeo-Christian tradition, to the foundation of Western society and human rights. And human rights is for everyone, not just the people you agree with. And that has got to be re-emphasized in this hostile society environment that we're in where so many people immediately resort to anger instead of listening and instead of forgiving. And that's one of the great losses, I think, in the weakening of the Judeo-Christian tradition is this lack of forgiveness. If, if, I mean, you look up stuff that somebody wrote when they were in high school and they're going to lose their job for it. I mean, are you serious? I did lots of stupid stuff in high school. <laughs> I did stupid stuff as an adult. <laughs> but where is the where is the absolute love that we're supposed to have for a fellow human being? That was the problem in communism. There is no love. There's power and abuse of power, and that's not what we're here. Okay, well, that's a that's a very good um, uh, thing to send us off on. I, I guess what take it we're out of time here. Yes, and I wanted to go ahead and you know take this time to thank you, Father Ziger, for that amazing presentation and for providing us with your research and your investigation. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yes, of course, and also Dr. Bruss for cooperating with us in this event. I wanted to take this time to encourage everybody to please fill out the survey that'll pop up at the end of the event and remind you guys of the next event that we have during International Education Series, which will be Holocaust Remembrance by survivor Peter Stein. And if you guys are interested in attending that, you know, feel free to reach out to us or to be look out for the link in your email. And so thank you guys so much for attending and we look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Have a great day or a great afternoon. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye.